good evening everyone thank you for joining with us today please continue to hold we chat in few minutes thank you Good evening, everyone. Myself, Adira, and Ms. Pushpa from Department of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology, and Ms. Tarmi, Web Administrator, will be the host for the day. 
Welcome you all for today's HCC Unleashed Webinar Series 7. Let's commence the session by invoking the blessings of Almighty through a prayer. I request all the participants to silently invoke the blessing of Almighty through the prayer. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. I will worship your holy name. Bible reading. The reading from the book of Isaac, chapter 1, verses 1, 1 to 2, 8 to 10. All wisdom comes from the Lord. And wisdom is with them forever. Who can count raindrops or the sand along the stove? Who can count the days of the eternity? There is only one who is wise, and we must stand in our work before his throne. The Lord himself created wisdom. He saw her and recognizes her value. And so he filled everything he made with his wisdom. He gave some measures of wisdom to everyone, but poured out on those who loved him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Prayer Dear Almighty and ever-loving Father, we glorify and thank your holy name. You have showered us with abundant blessings and grace. Thank you that your presence is with us right now. We humbly ask you to shower your blessings to today's speakers of your greatest inspiration so that they may share the most of their knowledge, heart, and soul to their respective topics. We pray that you would deepen our comprehension, broaden our thinking, and transform our understanding of what we are about to learn. We pray you to bless all the committees in charge so that they may be able to fulfill their task responsibly and the aim they have set may all be achieved. Your infinite blessing would mean the success of this webinar and may we be a living witnesses of your love through the enactment of the knowledge acquired through this activity. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all. Now, may I invite Sister Vinarasi, Lecturer and Clinical Supervisor, Department of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology Program. Yes. Investment in knowledge pays best interest, said Benjamin Franklin. A warm word of welcome to one and all gathered here today. We are fortunate to have you all for seventh series of Unleash webinar series on vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. This beautiful reality would never have been possible without the constant hand of the Almighty. Hence, I invoke blessings of Almighty as we commence the webinar. First and foremost, it's my privilege to welcome our evergreen, young and energetic secretary, Reverend Dr. Annie Xavier, for her unstrained support. I welcome our dynamic principal, Reverend Dr. Sister Christina Bridget for her guidance and encouragement in all our efforts. A hearty welcome to our enthusiastic academic coordinator, Reverend Dr. Sister Luz Mary, who has been a pillar of support in all our endeavors. 
I am extremely delighted to welcome the resource person for the day, Mr. Vignesh, for having accepted a humble invitation. I would like to extend my word of welcome to all the delegates and dear students. We all gathered here today to enhance our knowledge in vestibular evoke myogenic potential. This webinar intends to unravel the better clinician in each one of us. In the end, I thoroughly pleased to witness you all, dear students, here in this webinar series. Once again, I welcome you all. Thank you. Presently, may I invite our speaker of the evening, Mr. Vignesh S.S., Faculty, Institute of Speech and Hearing, Madras Medical College, Chennai. Sir is a passionate teacher and research enthusiast. His area of research interests are diagnostic audiology, vestibular and rehabilitative sciences. Sir has several national and international publications and has been a resource person in various institutions. Right away, we'll surrender the opportunity to our speaker. Now, may I humbly request Sir to assume control over the meeting. Over to you, Sir. Uh, thank you. In the month, I think. Am I audible to all? Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Uh, is my presentation uh, visible? Uh, your screen. Is it visible now? Is it visible now? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Now, is my screen visible? Uh, sir, it is not visible. One minute. There is some issue with the. Is it visible? No, sir. I'll just uh, connect in a moment again. I will re rejoin again. Okay, sir.
Uh, my PowerPoint is not uh, showing in the screen. I, I don't know why. My, I opened my PowerPoint. I could not connect it. It's not mirroring. So there it is not showing in my uh, screen. Uh, so should I share? Uh, so should I try sharing from the system? If I give you the mail ID, can you share the presentation? Is that possible, sir? Yeah, yeah, that's possible. But uh, let me check again. Okay, sir. One second. Is it visible now? So it was Sir, visible for a I... second. Okay. What is the... Uh, Sir, yeah. it is visible now. Is it visible? Uh, Sir, it just uh, blinked and now it is black. Uh, it is... I could not see my screen itself, that is blank again. Uh, what is the issue?
Is my screen visible? Yeah, yes, sir, it is visible, but it stops presenting. Uh, yes, sir. If you I have sent it uh, this thing, you can uh, uh, present from your side. Yes, sir. I got the mail. I'm downloading. Just a minute, sir. Yeah. Am I audible to all? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay. So before starting my presentation, I'd like to uh, uh, thank the organizers, uh, uh, Holy Cross College and uh, Mr. Sundaresan sir, uh, for the for giving me the opportunity to present in this uh, webinar series. Uh, so, um, so our topic today is uh, vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, uh, its basics and its applications in uh, uh, the clinical population. So, vestibular myogenic potentials has been uh, described in literature in 1994 uh, by Cole Batch and its colleagues. And uh, till now, there have been uh, lots of several publications. If you type uh, vestibular evoked myogenic potentials in uh, uh, Google, it will lead you to several articles, more than 5,000 articles you can get, I think, on vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. So, there are uh, so let us see that uh, 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 what are those. Uh, I'll just give you an overview of what will be there in the presentation. So I'm going to cover initially about uh, what are these potentials. And later, uh, 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 I'm going to describe what are the uh, various, how do you record it? What are the protocols being used for recording? In clinical practice, what are the various web uh, 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 types that are used? And what are the recent trends that are happening in this uh, vestibular myogenic potentials also? Uh, have you got my presentation? Uh, yes, sir. I got it. Can I start sharing it, sir? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, sir. Sir, is my screen visible? Yes, yes, your screen is visible. Okay, sir. Yeah, okay. So, oh yeah. So, vestibular myogenic potentials are, uh, as I said, uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah. So they are the short latency potential. Short latency means it occurs within 50 milliseconds uh, through activation of vestibular receptors using sound or vibration. Even electrical stimulus you can use to record VEMS. So for loud sound stimulation, these there are these are the short latency potentials. First and foremost thing that you have to remember. Second is it are modulated by electromyographic signals either from the sternocleidomastoid. It generate it is generated by a modulated electromyographic signals from the sternocleidomastoid muscle or an oblique muscle in case of ocular organ. These reflexes appear to originate from autolith organs, saccule and utricle, and thus complement existing method of vestibular assessment, which are mainly based on canal functions. So most of the vestibular assessment that we use are canal-based uh, functions, whereas this. Uh, uh, utricle and uh, this uh, 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 VEMS are from the autolith organs, which is really interesting. So uh, these are all myogenic responses. So muscle activity is required for this uh, responses, and uh, but they are generated from the vestibular system. Next slide, please. So there are several way VEMP and it's very several types of VEMP. One is called cervical VEMP, which is uh, 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 popular from uh, I think around 1994 it has become popular 
and clinically used. Acular VAMP, which is around uh, 2006 and 2000 itself, uh, from that time, it's, uh, uh, it has been become popular. Masseter VAMP, though they are being reported in other, uh, um, um, in 2005 itself, uh, it, now it is gaining little popularity. And bone conduction VAMPs and other variants, that is other muscles and galvanic uh, uh, variants also is there. So we can record uh, uh, VAMP vestibular evoked vestibular responses from other uh, muscles in the body like soleus muscle triceps all these uh, muscles we can record the vestibular uh, uh, the um, uh, for vestibular stimulation there will be some responses in these muscles that we can record so these have been commonly used in practice because cervical and ocular remember are become gained popular and because of its uh, contribution from individual uh, uh, vestibular autolith organs so cervical vamp is mostly from the circular system whereas ocular vamp is mainly from the utricular system next slide please so origin of vamps so when you see where is the origin of vamps so when you give a air conduction stimuli usually it will the first uh, the thing that will it will stimulate is the saccule and a little uh, higher intensity levels if you use it may stimulate your utricle anterior canal horizontal canal and posterior canal respectively Zhu et al. 2011 and 14. BC stimulus, bone conduction stimulus, that is, they can, it will stimulate uh, autolith organs, uh, saccule or utricle, it can stimulate. And a galvanic stimulus, if you use a current stimulus, a low uh, intensity direct current, if you use, it will ap activate the nerve rather than the end organs. So it will activate the vestibular nerve rather than the end organs. So cervical uh, of VEMS. For air conduction cervical VEM, saccule is the most uh, responsible uh, um, end organ responsible for it. So, uh, Welgam Apollo and Cole Batch 2001. BC VEM, mostly the organ responsible or from the uh, cervical VEM can be from your uh, saccule or utricle. And air conduction ocular VEM, uh, both uh, saccule and utricle, there have been several controversies. But uh, now it is almost, it is uh, uh, most of the time it is from the utricle only. So it's well agreed that it's from utricle. But for BC ocular vamp, it is predominantly from the utricle and it is bilaterally higher amplitude than air conduction stimuli. Next slide, please. So this is the pathway uh, from uh, the article published by Kohle Bech et al., where uh, they describe about uh, the various. Uh, um, um, the various uh, the path mechanisms there that is uh, the reflex pathways the cervical vamp is mainly mediated through the vestibular colic reflex pathway and the ocular vamp is by the vestibular ocular reflex pathway this vecular vestibular colic reflex pathway cervical vamp starts from the saccule so you can see that uh, um, uh, can I show the pointer here is it possible to show pointer on this yeah so no no can i can i know okay okay then fine okay cervical vamp is from saccule so you can see that it is from it initiate uh, the end organ stimulate is saccule so from there uh, um, uh, vestibular nuclei inferior vestibular nerve vestibular nuclei medial vestibular spinal tract and nucleus ambiguous spinal accessory nerve sternocleidomastoid muscle so there are uh, Mm. So this is the uh, this is the system that you can uh, that is a pathway that has been it's a descending pathway. So the vestibular input goes to the vestibular nerve and uh, the through in the brainstem. If you say from the pontine level uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, um, uh, medullary level, these tracts go and then innervate the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So it's a reflex mechanism, reflex pathway. So you should understand that it's a reflex pathway. Because they reflex means then there is a stimulation, there is always a muscle activation which is happening. And uh, all these VEMs are, have, are based on some reflex pathways. So, and they help in maintaining the uh, head movement uh, with, the, um, with the changes in the vestibular sensation. So, if there is a vestibular stimulation, accordingly the head movements are uh, 
maintained and balanced by these reflexes. Ocular vestibulo ocular reflex pathway, it is mediated from the utricle, superior vestibular nerve, vestibular nuclei, medial longitudinal fasciculus, oculomotor, and oculomotor nerve, and inferior oblique muscle. So it's an ascending pathway, and you should remember that it goes to the contralateral side. Uh, so it supplies to the contralateral oculomotor nuclei and to the oculomotor nerve and to the contralateral inferior oblique muscle. Okay. So these are the recordings, normal recordings of a. Uh, so the, there is a recording that is shown on the right side for cervical vein, where it shows a P13 and N23, ipsilateral and contralaterally. And uh, the ipsilaterally P13, as you see that the, the responses are larger for uh, ipsilateral, ipsilaterally than contralaterally. Whereas for ocular VEMP, it, the, the, it is, uh, the responses are higher for the um, ipsilate, uh, uh, contralaterally than the ipsilateral, uh, ipsilaterally recordings. Next slide, please. So this is a, a pathway, vestibular masseteric reflex pathway for masseter VEMP where we have uh, uh, the, the auditory vestibular, uh, front vestibular nerve, which gets stimulated, uh, which supplies to the vestibular nucleus and vestibular trigeminal monosynaptic pathway. And uh, from there, vestibular nuclei, it uh, moves to the vestibular uh, the trigeminal motor nucleus, which is shown in red color, and uh, trigeminal motor nerve, which is there in the uh, yellow color. So, vegetable trigeminal nerve supplies bilaterally. This pathway is like a bilateral pathway and uh, whether you stimulate on right side or left side, this pathway is going to be triggered and which will result in uh, the, the inhibitory action over the mesotar uh, muscles. So, it has a bilateral inhibition, inhibitory action. So, whether you stimulate on right side or left side, both side mesotar uh, muscles, inhibitory actions are uh, will happen. So this is a bilateral, uh, a bilaterally, uh, a bilaterally uh, mediated potential, and uh, from the right side. So, but, but the when end organ for stimulation is not exactly known, but uh, mostly it has been reported by uh, the author as uh, saccule. So from saccule it goes to the vestibular nucleus, and uh, from from the vestibular nerve it goes to the vestibular nucleus. And from the vestibular nucleus to the trigeminal nerve, nucleus, motor nucleus, and trigeminal nerve, and to the masseter muscle. Next slide. So, what are the characteristics of cervical, ocular, and masseter nerve? So, I'm covering these three because they have gained a lot of papers. Maybe around there are around uh, several papers on uh, uh, the cervical and ocular webs, and more than around uh, 30, 20 to 30 papers in uh, masseter web also. So more research articles are evolving. So it gained more uh, clinical, more clinical papers comes. The potential will come into clinical practice. So characteristics, if you see, the latencies are between P13 and N23 milliseconds. For ocular WEMP, it is N10 and P15. For masseter WEMP, it is P11 and N21. So it means that it, the, 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 the uh, latencies of these uh, peaks would occur at P13 means here. Uh, Positive. All three, all three potential are biphasic responses. Biphasic means it will have a positive, a positive peak and a negative peak. P is positive, N is negative, and uh, they will be uh, a biphasic, a shorter latency potentials, which is occur within uh, 15 milliseconds. So P13 and N23, N10 and P15, P11 and N21. So N21 means the negative peak would occur around 21 milliseconds. So responses are ipsilateral sternocleidomastoid mastoid muscle for ocular vamp it is contralateral eye inferior oblique and masseter vamp it is bilateral masseter muscles. The nature is it has the cervical vamp and masseter vamp are inhibitory action. That means it is it has inhibitory action with the uh, on the um, uh, the sternocleidomastoid and masseter muscles. Whereas uh, the ocular uh, the, the ocular vamp is an excitatory. Uh, excitatory nature is excites uh, the uh, neurons and uh, the, the the muscle action is get excited in the, the ocular vent. So origin I already discussed it is from saccule. It, this is predominantly from utricle and uh, it's proposed as saccule. The saccular responses here. Next slide. 
So we can use different stimulus modalities to evoke worms. One is uh, headphone or insert we can use. Usually inserts are better because they could give a good acoustic ceiling, comfortable to the patients. Uh, and uh, you can use click or tone burst. Most often preferred is tone burst. For frequency tuning, you can use uh, 4000 Hertz to 10,000 Hertz we can use. A bone vibrator stimulus, a BC B71, a bone, con bone conduction B71 with an amplifier is necessary. Uh, just uh, without amplifier, it, it cannot, uh, because we, the, the VEMS are usually generated for longer, uh, uh, louder sounds, above our 90, 90 to 100 dB NHL sounds. So hence we require, a, we require a higher uh, uh, um, and most of our conventional bone vibrators would go around 70 decibels maximum but they do not reach these levels 90 or 100 so you require an amplifier to reach that or you can use a mini shaker which has a higher amplitude as observed at 100 hertz or you can use head taps but they have very poor stimulus control because each tap would vary in the amplitude and this thing so they you don't have a very good control also Galvanic stimulus, we can use a load intensity intensity DC current, which is 44 to 5 milliamperes. It is delivered to the master, which is cathode stimulation. But the disadvantage is it cuts artifacts. It has like, galvanic why it is not used is it causes lots of artifacts. Uh, uh, degeneration of afferent in these cases would cause uh, uh, afferent in chronic cases. So you may not get a response in most of the time. So galvanic is not used. Air conduction and BVC bone conduction VEMS are commonly used. Okay, next, next slide. Yeah. So cervical VEMP, we will discuss now here. I am onwards. I am separating into a cervical VEMP and ocular VEMP. So protocols, if you see protocol, recording, interpretation, normatives, and factors affecting C VEMP, we will see. Next. So protocol, if you want for uh, most commonly a tone burst of 500 hertz is of choice because it gives maximum. Um, uh, uh, a larger response in most of the healthy individuals, normal individuals. Um, stimulation rate is 5.1 hertz is the preferable one. A stimulus intensity of 125 dB peak SPL. Uh, so why this intensity level is chosen is uh, it is because of its uh, as, uh, because it produces 100% response rate in most of the individuals and most of the normal uh, subjects and uh, it is uh, well within tolerable limit and it does not cause damage to your cochlear cochlear organs if you give we can raise the intensity to 140 db peak spl but it is going to damage your hearing in case of uh, 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 these findings have been reported by reported by uh, uh, dr neeraj at all um, so uh, 125 is of best choice for web recording webs so you can use both these 125 for uh, for the ac web as well as pc web Polarity, we can use alternating polarity. Uh, filter setting is uh, 10 hertz to 12,000 hertz. Number of stimuli is around 200 stimuli. Amplification factor is 5,000 times. So electrode placement is uh, upper one third on the the, um, the uh, uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle. And inverting electrode is on the sternoclavicular junction and ground is on the forehead. And also we require a 20 milliseconds pre stimulus recording for uh, 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 for this thing. 60, for 60 milliseconds at least you require post stimulus recording and 20 milliseconds for pre stimulus recording. I'll discuss why we need it. Next, next slide please. So this is the electrode placement for cervical web. So you have a ground electrode placed on the forehead and a non-inverting electrode which is on the upper one third. So you measure the total length of the, it's best way to do is you measure the total length from the mastoid till you are this thing divided into three segments. So you place your positive electrode on the upper one third of the sternocleidomastoid mastoid muscle. So, and the inverting electrode is placed on the uh, sternoclavicular junction. So where there is a sternum and there's a clavicle bone meets together. And uh, this montage is called as belly tendon montage. Belly tendon means the belly of the, the, the positive Electrode is placed on the belly and the negative is placed on the tendon. Okay, that's why it's called as a belly tendon montage is used for recording them. So you ask the patient to sit and turn their head steadily towards the opposite, towards, towards the side, opposite to the side of the, opposite to the side of stimulation. So if you are stimulating your left side, 
So in this, you can see in this figure, figure that you are stimulating the left ear, and the patient is asked to turn the head towards the right. So, next. So this is a recording of cervical VEM. So we have a, a EMG biofeedback. So for recording VEMs, you basically require two things. One is a biofeedback, uh, a, a EMG biofeedback you require. And also we require, uh, 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 we require a rectification protocol. The biofeedback is usually given to show the patient how much they are contracting, how much muscle, uh, muscle uh, contraction they are making. Suppose if they are turning the head very strongly, uh, it may the needle may go to 100. So you can see that 0, 50, 100, 150, 200 like that. So a yeah, maximum contraction yeah, normal would usually do is around 200. They can easily go up to 200. But these uh, EMG, these uh, recording, CVM recordings are done from 30 to 50 percent of the maximum voluntary contraction of the muscle. So if you contract the muscles uh, forcefully, uh, maximally you can stimulate if you if for example if a person can stimulate uh, uh, stimulate 200 uh, uh, 200 microvolt then you can um, uh, you, you can uh, ask the patient to set his uh, uh, minimum and maximum between uh, uh, 30 to 70 or or from 50 to 100 uh, microvolts you can ask them to maintain so usually, but most of the research papers, what they recommend is around uh, you, at least you require 70 microvolt contraction to have a good, uh, um, good uh, cervical VEMS. Many of the geriatric patients have trouble in these. They cannot maintain around uh, 50 or above that. So sometimes uh, you may have to motivate them to steadily contract the muscle. And uh, this is a mean rectified voltage. So what is shown here in this graph is mean rectified voltage. Can you play the video? Can you go to the next slide? Yeah. So you can see that it's a biofeedback, EMG biofeedback. You can see that that's a recording is happening in this. Can everyone see the video? Yes. Okay. So you can see a positive peak at 10 milliseconds and a negative peak at uh, 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 somewhere around 21 milliseconds. So the patient is looking at the monitor and he's constantly monitoring his, uh, how much he is uh, he's contracting. You see, sometimes he's going to the needles deflecting to 150 uh, a microvolt also, but he's asked to maintain a constant muscle tension to avoid the effects of muscle tension. Okay, to avoid the effects of muscle tension over the uh, C ramp amplitude. Okay, next slide. So EMG normalization. So what we usually we record is we, we get a response like this P13 and N23 responses. But uh, these responses are affected by the muscle tension. So what we see in the upper panel is a unrectified EMG uh, average. The What we see in the lower uh, graph is a rectified EMG average. In a, in a, in a unrectified average, a flat baseline with the Little EMG noise enables clear identification of P13 and N23. So in an inductified waveform, you can identify the P13 and N23. So you can see that the lower, uh, this thing is 105 voltage. The upper N2 is 120 microvolts. So that's what we have got the peak to peak, peak to peak amplitude. So 105 minus 120, which will give around somewhere around, uh, 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 it is going to mention the total uh, total uh, uh, amplitude, which is around 225 uh, microvolts. Okay, so that's the that is the total amplitude. So you add this 120 plus uh, 105, which is around 225 microvolts, is the unrectified peak to peak amplitude. Okay, so first is whatever you get is peak to peak amplitude. But this peak to peak amplitude is uh, variable. So as the patient to do some more contraction, suppose a person is able to contract 150 microvolts, steadily he is able to do that. Then what this is going to do happen is this uh, amplitude is going to increase. If he is doing lesser contraction, this amplitude is going to reduce. So this is affected by the muscle tension. So unrectified EMG average is affected by the muscle tension. To avoid that, what we do is we get a inrectified EMG average. In rectified EMG average, you can see that uh, x-axis, it is 0, minus 10, minus 20, 10, 20 is there, and all is there. So there, uh, a pre-stimulus, in a pre-stimulus duration, 
uh, if we are going to rectify the waveform, rectify means you all the negative breaks, you make it positive and find out the average to determine the average level of activation that is mean rectified EMG we are going to calculate. That's the unaffected by the evoked response. So a simple, so this, this period, this pre-stimulus period means it is not affected by the, uh, it is not uh, uh, changed by any stimulus so we, we we are not giving any stimulus in this uh during this uh, pre-stimulus period so in that period only the muscle contraction will be there not because not the changes due to the stimulation will be there so that region is taken that is a pre-stimulus duration the rectified emg average in the pre-stimulus duration is taken for calculating the corrected amplitude same so simple method to correct uh, for different levels of activation is to express that is P13 and N23 uh, ampl uh, amplitude as a ratio of the mean rectified activity here giving 2.34. That is the total amplitude is 225 and the mean rectified is 96 microvolts in the pre-stimulus duration. So the corrected amplitude is calculated by 225 divided by 95 which will give you 2.34 that is the corrected amplitude so this corrected amplitude is not affected by the muscle tension so i will show you in some other image uh, some other slide where uh, the how are they affected or not uh, how are they not affected next slide please so cvm interpretation so you take your cursor put in the positive peak mark p13 and uh, negative peak n23 and you make the peak to peak amplitude you calculate between p13 and n23 and that will tell you the peak to peak amplitude you can correct uh, you can calculate so latencies p13 n23 is calculated and already in the previous slide we saw how to calculate the corrected amplitude so it is by dividing this peak to amp peak to peak amplitude divided by the rectified emg uh, emg responses which will give you the corrected amplitude an intraoral asymmetry ratio, intraoral amplitude asymmetry ratio, interoral means between the years, inter means between the years, amplitude ratio, that is the amplitude of P13 and 23, corrected amplitude, that is a larger amplitude. So if you get two responses, right ear and left ear, one is larger, the another one is smaller, then we may calculate this amp amplitude ratio by uh, uh, reducing larger amplitude response minus smaller amplitude divided by the larger amplitude plus smaller amplitude into 100. So this formula is used to calculate the intraoral asymmetry ratio. So to decide whether there is any unilateral weakness in the vestibular system or there is any responses reduced in the vestibular system. Next slide. So criteria for abnormality for recording, for obtaining your CVMP and OVMP interpreting, you should have your own laboratory data. That is very, very important. First to do on few people, few individuals across the age group, find out what is your normative data. Two standard deviation of the latencies above or below, that is the amplitude values below above the age dependent normative data in your clinics, then that we can use it to define the abnormality. Suppose a person is getting a latency of 6, 15 milliseconds, P13 is observed at 15 milliseconds, you need to decide whether they are uh, whether they are normal or not, then you should be depending on your the standard deviation and the latency normatives or normative values to decide whether it is abnormal or not. The next one is intraoral asymmetry ratio above 30% that is, uh, is considered as abnormal. Abnormal frequency tuning in case of Meniere's disease also is considered as abnormal. So I will discuss what is that in that is the, in uh, Meniere's disease section. And abnormal VEM threshold are also is considered as normality. That's a lower VEM threshold. Yeah. Factors affecting CVM. So patient related factors, age, gender, uh, muscle tension, posture, type of stimulus, stimu uh, stimulus intensity, stimulus rate. These are the stimulus related factors and equation related factors. That is electrode placement, filter settings, amplification. All these could affect your responses. Next. So normative data is threshold increases and amplitude reduces with the age. So, and the, the above 50 to 60 years, the response may be absent or reduced. So what happens is uh, as the age increases, there is some degenerative changes that could happen in the otolith organs. So hence the amplitude may reduce and sometimes it may be absent also. 
and uh, the response rates that is if you take a uh, hundred patients uh, between the age of 50 to 60 uh, maybe uh, uh, uh 90 percent of them may have webs one five to ten of them may not have c webs also or it may be reduced so but below 50 it is definitely present in all so that we should understand so the threshold uh, levels uh may increase that is a web threshold level if you say the, the web threshold is the minimum intensity level where you can find a web response so that may be increased as with the age and the amplitude is going to reduce latency often is not is unchanged with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the age and below 50 seconds so if below 50 the amplitude asymmetry must not may not be should not be greater than 30 mostly if it is greater than 30 then it indicates a abnormal functioning next slide please so effect of transducers on cvm responses this is a nice picture of uh, from Kohle Bech et al. 2016 article on review article where they show different WEMS aligned with the same time duration. So you see, you see that uh, analysis window is 0 to 100, 100 milliseconds and uh, for air conduction stimuli, for bone conduction stimuli, for it, terps and galvanic stimulation, what are the various uh, responses they have shown here? So if you say that it's for left side stimulation, from the figure you can see that it's from left side I think you can use the pointer to show me that will be easy for the left side stimulation. Uh, the air conduction stimulus uh, is from the, 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 the muscles recorded or bilaterally it is recorded. So both the sternocleidomastoid muscles, the recording is carried out. For air conduction stimuli, it is P11N21. And for bone conduction stimuli, it is P11, P1, P, uh, 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 sorry, P13N23, which is P1, uh, it is mentioned as P1N1. And uh, the for bone conduction stimulus, you can say that ipsilaterally it is higher in amplitude. For bone vibration, also the in contralaterally there is some response, but it is uh, smaller than the ipsilateral response. So for left side stimulation, left side AC vamp is larger in amplitude, left side BC vamp is larger in amplitude. But for forehead taps, both side it is higher in amplitude. You can see that both side responses, both ipsi and contra, are having the uh, larger responses. And for galvanic stimulation also, you do find some responses in the uh, 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 this uh, uh, left side and the right side. Next slide. So effect of uh, uh, recording parameters. So if you say stimulus level, when this amplitude is influenced by the stimulus level that we use, stimulus frequency that we use, tonic EMG level that we are doing. But these recording parameters does not affect your uh, when latency, uh, it, it only affects the when amplitude. Next slide. So this is the effect of uh, stimulus. Uh, uh, this is from Akin et al. 2003, 2004. So he has recorded for different uh, intensity levels. On your left side, you can see that the for 90 dB, there is some responses, but it's not really evident. It's not visible. But in 95, you get a very good response. At 100 dB NHL, you have a very good uh, response of P1 and N21. Whereas for stimulus frequencies, you can see that same intensity is being maintained, but a different, uh, the dBSPL is 120 dBSPL. So across the intensity level, if you compare the, uh, between the frequencies, you see that the 500 Hertz is having a higher, larger uh, amplitudes then compared to 1000 hertz, 2000 hertz and 1500 hertz. So you see that 2000 hertz, there is absolutely no web at even at 120 dB. Okay, so at lower levels, definitely there is nothing. But uh, at uh, um, um, uh, higher intensity levels, there is some kind of response at even at 2000 hertz in normal subjects. So more for this particular reason, 500 hertz tone burst is commonly used because it shows a higher amplitude, larger responses we can evoke. So a stimulus intensity you use around 95 to 100 dB in nature. Next. So corrected amplitude. So corrected amplitude, this is the effect of muscle tension. Okay. So this is from the article by McCaslin et al. 2014 and where he has used uh, different amount of muscle tension. So he has asked different people, group of people, normal people, to maintain different uh, muscle contraction levels. So in your left side, you see an uncorrected P13N23 amplitude. 
in the right side of your screen we have we have a corrected p13 n23 amplitude so the what is we are seeing in the x axis is the emg target level so the patient that we show i showed in uh, a red and uh, the red and green indication no so where the patient has to look at the screen and maintain the target levels which is around 100 200 300 400 they have set the different target levels and you could see that the uncorrected p13 n23 amplitude is increasing with the change in the emg target level suppose a person is able to if it's a healthy person and he is able to maintain a target of 200 microvolts easily he will get a higher amplitude of uh, uh, vems c vems than a person who could not uh, do that but if you see the corrected amplitude since we are correcting to the muscle tension you see that it is fairly stable across the muscle tension levels so hence the recommended corrected amplitude that is uh, recommended uh, the, the corrected amplitudes are recommended for evaluation estimation or interpretation of your cervical ones next next slide please. so click versus tone bus even so it is click and tone bus we are using we are seeing how is the comparisons and across the ac bc and all so here the the stimulation is over the right side in all the conditions for bone vibrator is usually bilateral so when you do a forehead stimulation both the sides uh, is going to equally get stimulated for air conduction p13 n23 you can see ipsilaterally for air conduction stimuli and for bone conduction stimuli also same uh, for uh, uh, for a, a bc tone burst sorry yeah, you see that the amplitude of uh, click is uh, lower in the figure one the, the upper portion of the screen you can see that the p13 n23 is uh, smaller in amplitude when compared to the tone burst okay when compared to the tone burst on the ac tone burst on the second uh, uh, figure and uh, the third uh, the, the third and uh, fourth figures you can see that it's for bc stimuli the one is the upper one is by bc b71 tone burst stimuli and the lower one is by mini shaker the the the, the thing that is shown on that uh, figure is called mini shaker it is going to uh, produce a vibratory sensors over that and it is going to produce a bilateral so bc stimulus whenever you st you stimulate uh, the skull it is going to produce bilateral responses and uh, the, the amplitude even though the contra is smaller than the ipsi that means that the ipsilateral tracks are stronger for the sternocleid for the c pathway is stronger okay so the the um, um, so so it points to remember is the click uh, tone burst a tone burst is uh, a longer in latency when compared to the uh, click stimuli and the amplitude are larger for tone burst stimuli than the click stimuli next next ocular web so from here onwards we'll see what are the ocular web protocol recording interpretation normatives and factors affecting ocular web next slide Ocular WEMP is a result of brief introduction interpretation in the continuous EMG activity of the inferior oblique muscle produced by an acoustic stimulation. OEMs are shorter latency biphasic potentials. They have a similar threshold as of CWEMs. It is present irrespective of the hearing threshold. So they are not, you should, the point that we, basic point you have to remember, remember is even profound hearing loss patients, you can record WEMPs. Even they don't have any res any response in your uh, ABR, you can definitely record them. So they are not affected by hearing thresholds uh, like your cervical VEMS and both uh, uh, masseter VEMS and all these things are not affected by your hearing thresholds. Not not, not recorded in vestibular pathologies involving hyperfunction, and it is present in hyperactive vestibular systems. It is absolutely present. Todd et al. 2003. Next slide. Overwhelm overcomes a few challenges with CVM, that is obtaining adequate muscle tension in elderly or people with muscle tone disorder, limited neck mobility, ensuring no web variations within and between subjects due to changes in muscle tone. So if some people cannot do a, produce a very good muscle contraction, so these effects have been overcome by the uh, uh, OVAMP. So CVM is affected by all these things. OVAMP is relatively comfortable. But there are few pathologies that will affect worm also that also I will discuss in last. Next time. Next time. Electrode placement. You can see the electrode placement. The electrode, positive electrode is placed over the inferior oblique muscle. So you can see that purple color one, the electrode which is uh, there 
so that is the placement the positive is placed a negative electrode is placed two centimeters below the midline the the the, the point the the it is placed and the forehead we are going to uh, we are having a common electrode so usually uh, the patient is asked to sit straight and uh, uh, maintain your eye gazing of at least 25 uh, 25 degree from the uh, straight line from the horizontal line to his eye so if you draw a horizontal line to his eye at least he is asked to to maintain a eye gazing 25 degree above the uh, uh, from the horizontal line okay so you place a target at 25 degree uh, from the place of uh, 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 this thing but uh, you should also always consider the height of a person if he is a very uh, 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 a tall person if he is the, the height may vary so you should take care of those things if it's a very short person you may have a uh, the, the level may be too high for him to reach the target level so you should correctly measure the eye level and place the target over that in the wall you can stick it so you i can ask them to look at the target at least 25 uh, degrees are recommended so you can see that the this is by counter at all in 2009 uh, where he has uh, measured the uh, at different uh, eye gaze positions he has measured we know that this is a uh, one is uh, recorded contralaterally uh, have a higher amplitude than the ipsilaterally um, uh, uh, as the eye gazing is increased, minus 20 is below from the midline, uh, plus 20 is above from the midline, plus 20, plus 10, plus 20 has a good amplitude, plus 20 has a very good amplitude at maximum uh, uh, elevation uh, produces a really good overwhelm amplitude. But uh, most recommended clinically is 25 degree to 30 degrees uh, um, eye gazing is recommended for recording OMs. Next slide. Stimulus is same, similar, tone burst of 500 hertz, stimulation rate is 5.1, stimulus intensity is 125 dB peak SPL, polarity is uh, alternating. The filter settings, uh, recently they have mentioned recommended 0.1 to 1 hertz, you can use to 1000 hertz. Number of stimuli recorded is 200 times, amplification factor is 3000, 30,000 times uh, is required. So this is a smaller, relatively shorter potential when compared to CMM. So the amplification required is larger in this case and a non-inverting electrode is placed one centimeter below the center of the eyelid which is the inferior oblique muscle and inverting electrode is placed from two centimeter below the non-inverting electrode. Ground is in the forehead and you require a recording time of 70 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds is the pre-stimulus recording. Next slide. So similar way you can record latencies of APN10, uh, P15 latencies peak to peak amplitude can calculate interaural amplitude asymmetry ratio is there can calculate so here what we are calculating is absolute peak to peak amplitude not the not the corrected amplitude corrected amplitude is not used in overwhelms uh, but the pm uh, peak to peak amplitude absolute latencies are taken into consideration amplitude ratio can be calculated by the same same formula left into minus the smaller plus the higher and then you can calculate that uh, the, 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 the formula, Jonkey's formula can be used to uh, find the amplitude asymmetry ratio. Criteria for abnormality is similar to standard deviation above, then you can have intraoral asymmetry ratio above 30% and also you can measure the frequency tuning to consider the abnormality. Next slide. This is the normative data of OVM, that is you can see the effect of age and gender. This has been published by Piker et al. Uh, 2011. She has uh, published uh, 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 like CVM, OVM, redu OVM is reduced in amplitude with age and uh, prolonged latencies. So you can see that they are required for 1 to 18, uh, two, two year, uh, uh, three groups they have taken, less than 18, 18 to 49 years and greater than 50 years. So here uh, the mean age, uh, mean age, mean um, uh, um, the number of patients that they have taken is shown. So you can see that around uh, in younger age groups, N, N1 tone burst for tone burst stimuli. So you should remember that for click it is different, tone burst is different. Uh, click is uh, usually it arrives at uh, N10, 10 milliseconds, but whereas for a tone burst, it may be around 11 to 12 milliseconds, you can see a, in, uh, a N10 response. P11 is around 17.1, 17 and all. So the latency is fairly good, stable, that is not so much change is observed. 
but you can look at the amplitude the amplitude is going to reduce with increase in the age and uh, across the age age and uh, 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 most of the study says there is no much gender differences but some studies do suggest that uh, there are few gender differences between males and females uh, for ovm recording next slide so similar way for uh, parameters could affect is type frequency repetition rate intensity polarity ac versus bc few of the things i will discuss here i'm not completing everything uh, but uh, very few i'm uh, i'm i'm, I'm uh, uh, discussing uh, here next slide so effect of transducers so you can see that uh, it is a for left uh, stimulus so for left side with stimulation we get a good response in the right eye okay so the left eye also we can record some responses but it is smaller in amplitude but ear connection sounds produces a larger contralateral ovm responses bone vibration stimulus can produce both side ovm responses but uh, but the, the other ear is uh, little uh, ipsilaterally it is smaller in amplitude of uh, uh, forehead taps can produce both and uh, galvanic stimulation also can produce both but the polarity changes you have to look at the polarity here it is p1 n1 that is n1 and p1 next slide so click stimuli so this is a click versus stone burst so same intensity levels it has been recorded in this and you can see that the latency is of the click ohm is smaller when compared to the tone burst and uh, and they have a larger amplitude the the tone burst ohms have larger amplitude when compared to click amplitude next slide so tone burst frequency similar finding that we have seen uh, dr neeraj and barman at all 2013 has seen the characteristics of tuning properties of air conduction ocular ohms in healthy individuals and they have found that the 500 to they have checked between 250 to 2000 hertz at all octaves and mid octaves 500 hertz produces the largest amplitude and uh, 500 and 750 produce the largest amplitude and best threshold so that can be used for clinically purpose also so next slide repetition rate so what is going to do is they have changed the repetition rate uh, neeraj uh, nk et al and uh, they have studied the uh, repetition rate and they have found that that Ah, five point one produces a very good. They have seen around three point one, five point one, ten point one per second repetition rate, and they have found that the latency is prolonged and amplitude reduced with increasing in rate. So you can see in the figure also that the latencies are produced, that the latencies are increasing with the increase in the with the increase in the uh, repetition rate, and the amplitude is going to reduce. 5.1 hertz has a high snr and requires lesser duration for recording and has a better efficacy than 3.1 so hence a 5.1 is best for clinical recording of ocular vent next slide similar way stimulus intensities uh, with increase in the intensity amplitude is increased and no change in the latency so as you increase the intensity above 100 or 125 db spl 125 130 135 the latency is not going to change but the amplitude is going to increase uh to you can see in the graph there they have mentioned 100 105 115 120 125 like that you can see that the latency is fairly same but the amplitude is increasing with the increase in the amplitude increase in the intensity of the stimulus next slide stimulus polarity so no change in latency in amplitude so wavehel and singh 2015 have studied this and no change in latency and amplitude alternating polarity has higher and better snr signal to noise ratio when compared to rarefaction and condensation so hence alternating is used for for the most of the clinical recording purposes next slide monaural or binaural so when you record you can record uh, cervical vem sinusoidal vem both uh, monaurally and binaurally monaurally means you present uh, you give the uh, uh, stimulate on right side and left or left uh, record from the left eye binaurally means you stimulate both the sides and record from both the side both the eye also you can record so simultaneously you can finish your testing which is very quicker uh, you can use that means you can use the two channel recording or single channel recording 
a single channel recording no significant differences in latencies and uh, amplitude and the asymmetry ratios between monaural and binaural you can see in OVAMP in healthy individuals and individuals with vestibular pathologies. Binaural produces some capacity for differentiating normal and pathological conditions as MM. So this is also based on the study. Next, next, uh, next slide. Ipsi and contralateral, uh, Ipsi and contralateral stimuluses. So longer latency in ipsilateral responses than contralateral. Smaller amplitude in ipsilateral responses and contralateral responses. So this is predominantly a contralateral responses. It, the stronger pathway is a contralateral pathway. And so you will get a larger amplitude in contralateral and shorter latency in contralateral OVAMP responses. Next slide. Body positions. O'Neill et al. has studied these body positions, which is straightening straight forward with chin level, lying down, supine, lateral, right, left, lateral, left and all. He found that the sitting upright is best produces over than in the other positions. Okay. So other similar, uh, similar finding has been uh, obtained by several other authors also. Next slide. So when we, we are moving into the Masseter WEMP here, so I will give a few slides on Masseter WEMP also. So Masseter vestibular processions are bilateral responses recorded from the Masseter muscle for monaural and bilateral electrical stimulation or for loud acoustic stimuli. So this is a typical waveform of, uh, 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 of a Masseter WEMP. The Drew et al. 2005, he has studied, it produces a P11 response and a N21 response. P15 is uh, appears as a small deflection in the biphasic responses are often undetectable in healthy, sub healthy individuals. This N15 is not ob obviously identified by several uh, people, several places, uh, but the NP11 and N21 is often uh, visible in all the patients, uh, all the normal population. So this uh, uh, biphasic P11 are termed as vestibular masseter responses. Next slide. So these, uh, there are components, there are two components for acoustic stimulator in the masseter muscle. So one is called as uh, uh, vestibular masseter reflex. The another one is called as jaw acoustic reflex. So this P11 N21 has two components. One is called as a shorter latency component called P11 N15 and a longer latency con component called as uh, uh, P16 N21. This P11 N215 is of vestibular origin and uh, longer latency low threshold uh, that is, uh, it, you can even obtain below the vestibular stimulation level, that is, which is vestibular stimulation level is around 90 to 100 decibels. Below that, the vestibular is not going to stimulate. So below these levels, still you can find some responses in masseter muscle and they are called as uh, uh, long latency low threshold, that is P16 N21 responses. So there are auditory, these are called as auditory responses. Jaw acoustic reflexes, uh, uh, this is uh, the, the uh, we are not it's, not, it's not of our interest here. Uh, vestibular masseter reflexes will produce, it's a bilateral symmetrical responses produced for unilateral stimulation. Next slide. So this is the electrode placement for uh, uh, this thing so the two different electrode montages are there what is called mandibular montage zygomatic uh, montage electrode placement for mm masseter mm d lentil et al 2019 has this image from their article and it shows that the mandib mandibular montage has an active electrode is placed in the lower third of the masseter muscle and uh, the the or a zygomatic reference uh, the man mandibular angle so it is written written as mandref so man ref is there, mandibular angle, that electrode placement. Whereas for zygomatic, it is uh, the active electrode is same. That is in the lower third of the masseter muscle. The zygomatic reference which is placed in the middle of the zygomatic arch and the ground electrode is placed on the forehead. Next slide. So same instrumentation for CVM can be used for recording MM. You require dual channel evoke potentials. So I have published, we have published an article on uh, tone burst uh, normative data on tone burst evoked uh, um, myogenic potential in, my, in our, from our uh, lab. So uh, the type of stimulus, most often you can use click stimulus and uh, tone burst also you can, uh, it works well with the masseter one. Mode of stimulation, you can use uh, monaural and binaural recording, you can stimulate uh, monaurally and binaurally. Usually the binaural responses are higher, larger in amplitude, 30% larger in amplitude than the monaural stimulation in masseter one. Transducer, again, you can use headphones or insert receivers. 
stimulation rate is 3 hertz to 5 hertz so best stimulation level that they have measured dina today at all measured is 128 to 138 db spl but in our study we have found that even 125 db peak spl tone burst we can uh, we can evoke a similar responses we can good day we can obtain a very good uh, masseter responses in a group of population in a large group of, in a, in, a, in healthy subjects number of stimuli is 300 to 500 stimulus we can record next slide amplification is 5000 times same as uh, same as that of uh, cvm uh, filter settings is uh, low pass uh, uh, the, the uh, low pass low cutoff frequency is 0.3 to 5 hertz and a high cutoff frequency is 2000 or 5000 hertz you can use pre stimulus interval of 50 milliseconds is required and post stimulus recording of 100 milliseconds is recommended posture is you ask the patient to sit straight head straight limb flexed in a position and maintain 30 to 50 percent of the maximum voluntary contraction next slide so estimate the maximum water steps what are the steps is given is estimate the maximum voluntary contraction of the muscle select the target muscle target levels between 30 to 50 percent of the maximum contraction instruct the patient to sit in an upright posture bind the jaw steadily to activate both the muscle masseter muscles simultaneously maintain the muscle tension within the target levels using visual feedback so similar visual feedback of cvp is used next slide next oh yeah the following parameters can be used like absolute latencies of p11 n21 p11 uh, n21 peak to peak amplitude mean rectified amplitude p11 n21 corrected amplitude all these things we can measure amplitude ratio asymmetry ratio we can measure next slide so this is the normative data you can see that uh, for tone burst uh, evoked mm -hmm. p11 latency is around 13.2 whereas for click evoked is 11.7 uh, P20 N21 is from 21.4 and 19.68. Peak to peak amplitude is 0.86 and click amplitude is 0.72. Uh, amplitude asymmetry ratio is 15.07 and 14.56. Uh, the amplitude is even though it's higher, it's higher for the uh, for the uh, click stimuli, the, the, the tone burst stimuli than for the click stimuli. Next slide. So here it has also got good test retest reliability. Um, um, uh, myself and another uh, author by Lowy et al. 2020 has shown that this also has good uh, test retest reliability in all the uh, healthy individuals. Next slide. So factors affecting again there are several uh, factors. Similar things the effects that we see in the CVM and OVM are seen in this or here also. So yeah, as the age increases the uh, the, the the level reduces the 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 the, uh, the amplitude reduces next slide so responses reduces with the age of 46 years and latency increases and the amplitude reduces in this case for both unilateral and bilateral stimulation next slide gender differences some authors have said that normative data said that most of the normative data available is on click click mm but you can use it for tone burst also but the click the, the females have shorter latency than males these without any amplitude differences shorter latencies are reported by the authors d later 2019 next slide muscle tension do affect these masseter webs also so as the muscle tension increases the amplitude of mm also increases next slide Effect of body tilt, so vertical position and body tilt over 30 degree has been studied. And if you move your body towards uh, ipsilatory on the same side, it is going to increase your uh, increase your amplitude. And when you move your body toward the contractor side of stimulation, that is uh, right side when you are giving a sound and you are moving your body to the left side, which is going to reduce your amplitude. No ear differences has been reported in tone burst uh, evoked MM responses also. Next slide. Stimulus intensity, the amplitude is going to increase with the increase in the uh, intensity levels. But the best uh, best intensity level to evoke is between 128 to 135 dB SPL, denatal at all 2019. Next slide. 
monaural so already i told that binaural responses are higher in amplitude this figure shows that uh, the binaural responses are larger in amplitude that is these are all mm responses you may wonder why some response some figures show in a different way uh, only the change in the positive and negative polarity is that that's causing the uh, p level some some inter some slide shows uh, n1 down some slide shows uh, n1 in upper uh, level uh, uh, on the uh, on the uh, uh, positive side so this is due to the placement of electrodes that they have used and uh, the, the how they record also it matters yeah it's just the polarity change nothing else bilateral clicks have larger uh, responses than the unilateral clicks next slide so electrode montage they say that zygomatic montage we study about two montages zygomatic and mandibular montages zygomatic montages is reported to have larger uh, response a uh, larger amplitude when compared to monaural montage mono uh, uh, when the mandibular montage next slide analysis of ems next slide so we can have different types of responses till now what we have seen is we have seen all these web types and other things now we'll go into a little clinical uh, applications of these uh, we can get to these kind these four types of responses in uh, uh, mm one is a normal responses prolonged latencies that means the latencies are longer than what is expected reduced amplitude and changes in morphology also we can see and you can see a absence of a potential also next slide so quantitatively we can assess uh, mark c m p 13 n 21 or mm we can measure p 11 n 21 and measure peak latencies peak to peak is calculated corrected amplitude is calculated for c m p and o m f c m p and m m accurate r m p are measuring the p 11 n 21 only asymmetry ratio is the same for all and measure frequency tuning if mean is disease or uh, if superior canal dehiscences syndrome is suspected we can use that next slide Uh, this is a newly uh, this is a recent article in the gabelic et al 2015 where they have introduced something called as wemp scoring system so you can give you can categorize it into 0 1 2 3 4 so they asked to give us a uh, uh, four uh, um, uh, uh, normal four uh, types of responses four different scoring is given zero is for normal increased latency is one two is for decreased amplitude and absence of potential so especially in uh, neurological disorders what happens as the neuron damages the, the neural axons get uh, damaged what will happen is the waveform first it will be normal uh, slowly it will change to increase latencies then uh, it will cause uh, 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 slowly as the damage increases what will happen it will cause uh, amplitude changes also finally the response itself will be absent so this uh, this grading system can uh, uh, help is be useful for assessing the severity of damage and you can be used for you can be used for uh, measuring the neural uh, uh, the, the 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 function also uh, in case and recovery also you can see suppose if you have got a neural damage and there is a recovery that is uh, you can you can see uh, then you can use these grading systems to document the recovery also so this scoring system is used to, it is used, it has been originally published for a uh, sternocleidomaster and this cvm and o1 so you have vem cvm scoring so vem uh, yes scm is a plus b that is a plus c so sternocleidom responses on the right side plus left side vem uh, o1 is b and d that is uh, on the o1 responses from right and left what is the score you mention you grade the grade the responses score them and total a plus b plus c plus d that is the total vem scoring you can measure there are several articles on vem scoring and uh, the uh, the users in uh, cell, uh, um um cvm uh, in the cvm and ovm in in central vestibular disorders interested people can go and read these articles for this uh, uh, research next slide so i'm going to clinical applications uh instead of just uh, telling it as a uh, single uh, um um uh, disease wise and uh, just giving i am giving few examples and recordings that we we have been uh, uh, have done in my i uh, have i have recently come across in my clinical practice so it will be useful for you next slide so the you can use this protocol so when where is where does the wem testing stand in vestibular testing so first you should know that 
you can see that this is a protocol for peripheral vestibular disorder and this is a protocol for central vestibular disorder so first a patient comes take case history physical examination suspected bppv if he says it's positional what i go when he lies down gets up he gets what i go the first state is yes do a dixal pack testing and confirm the positional vertigos if he says no then go for spontaneous gaze testing impulse testing the head impulse test and vem testing and hearing examination so vem is not a first test to do vem is always comes and there uh, uh, as a battery after the physical examination uh, after the clinical examination that is your uh, uh, the clinical uh, assessment of the patient it is the last test to do even hearing examination it comes last it comes to you as a audiologist it comes to you for the assessment uh for the vestibular system after the medical examination it comes to you for vestibular system where we will be using the head impulse testing uh, web testing hearing audiometric testing and spontaneous gaze testing or other vng eng and all we can do to diagnose the disorder central vestibular testing again uh, case history you go for neurological examination then physical exam physical exam then gaze uh, spontaneous nystagmus you see Uh, vestibular ocular reflex pathways q deviation head impulse test additionally we can do hearing exam and a vem testing also is recommended next slide so this is a protocol in clinical population that you can use first you start with c vem or o vem whatever it is i have just written for c vem you can we do it for o vem also uh, first when you check with uh, c vem uh, usually you can use uh, both the vems in your clinical practice uh usually single vemp is not recommend, recommended because two vems two different pathways it is testing it is better to use a two vemp protocol always so in our clinical setup i usually do both the vemps uh, record at 500 hertz tone burst so if it is present if they are present and absent so if the if it is absent both sides i stop the testing if it is present then compare the amplitude asymmetry ratio if the asymmetry ratio is less than 30 or less than 30 or 35% or uh, the etrol ratio is that less than that i record the cvm or ovm at 1000 hertz so why we do that is to see whether it's if it's a case of menias disease we want to see the tuning of uh, tuning of the response amplitude higher at 1000 hertz and we terminate the test that is uh, so when the when this uh, the asm ratio is 30% then we do the testing at 1000 hertz also rather uh, than 500 hertz and uh, usually in menias disease uh, 100 hertz is having higher amplitude than uh, cvm but in case of uh, 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 in case of normal people usually 500 hertz amplitude is uh, higher than the 1000 hertz amplitude so to check whether it is menias disease we can use this protocol if it is greater than 30% then yeah, i will recommend to estimate the threshold if it is really large if the asymmetry is really large more than uh, 60 80% uh, asymmetry 70 60 70% asymmetry a large web response you saw in one side then i recommend you to go for threshold check the web threshold at uh, uh, level uh, check the lem threshold of the patient and also you can use 4 kilohertz tone burst to study the to confirm whether it is uh, whether it is stern, uh, superior canal deviation syndrome or not then uh, if there is no response you have obtained that uh, if there is a asymmetry is there we can uh, increase if the asymmetry level is higher there is very small vem responses we can see then i'll suggest you to little increase the intensity and check uh, uh, whether there is a conduction block or uh, uh, we can uh, I'll recommend to see whether it is uh, 10% or 5 to 10 decibels we i ask you to uh, increase because higher intensity levels can damage your hearing organ if uh, uh, so it's not recommended for testing usually it is recommended at 125 db spl it's not recommended at higher intensity levels but you can re record that at higher intensity levels if it's a absent response you can at 125 you can increase the intensity and check whether it's a complete conduction block conduction block means there is no response nothing can enter into the vestibular system itself uh, vestibular unit itself this may be specifically useful in cases of uh, vestibular schwannoma where you may not if you do not find any response you can slightly increase your stimulation level 
uh, most of the times uh, patients with uh, profound losses or severe to profound hearing losses already whose hearing organ is damaged then you can definitely go with the higher intensity levels i feel but uh, it's my personal opinion but not other uh, people have been recommending this at higher intensity level testing most often it is done at 125 db spr next slide so we need to know common vestibular disorders so one is bppv the another one is functional dizziness central vestibular vertigo most commonly you will encounter bpp in your clinics uh, 30 to 40 percent is bpp only that again 20 to 30 percent is functional dizziness so we have to do vestibular testing to say it is functional first we may get all types of normal responses in these patients you may have uh, every test any test vestibular testing that we will do will be normal and still the patient reports all kinds of uh, functional uh, psychogenic uh, 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 vertigo and all. They may say that I feel dizzy, always I am, I feel dizzy, throughout the day I feel dizzy. These are all functional dizziness. And central vertigo, central vestibular vertigo and vestibular migraine, menius disease. Menius disease around 10 to 20 percent of the population will have menius disease. Acute vestibulopathies, acute vestibulopathy means once one uh, one uh, one side of the vestibular organ is affected. Bilateral means both sides it is affected. Uh, vestibular parasismia, superior canal dehiscence, uh, unknown causes also. Superior canal dehiscence and all is rare. Okay, superior canal is rare, but still you do get seen in my clinics. I have seen one or two patients with superior canal dehiscence. I have put the uh, in the case recording also. I have shown him. Next slide. So the peripheral disorder, vestibular disorder, we'll go into each application of this uh, in this population. Uh, I'm not covering everything, but uh, very commonly used, I will just tell you. High amplitude and lower threshold disorders, uh, superior canal dehiscence and third window syndrome, large vestibular acute syndromes, perilymph fistula. They usually you get a very large amplitude of OMs or CVM and a low threshold disorders low threshold uh, uh, low threshold disorders that means uh, uh, that you can even record around 65 decibels you can record your webs so older criteria for this uh, cvamp and ovm for these uh, superior canal dehiscence is cvamp if it is present at 65 or less you consider you call it as superior canal dehiscence that is your older uh, this thing there are two or three things also like uh, 80 db 85 db criteria and all is given but that has lower sensitivity Recent trends, new criteria shows that over amplitude of 17.1 microvolt or greater, it has 100% and 100% sensitivity and specificity for identifying superior canal dehiscence uh, disorders. And also OOM present at 4000 hertz, that is air conduction stimuli is also, so if you have a OOM, usually OOM was not seen in 4000 hertz. If you record, if you could record a 4,000 hertz, a, a over at 4,000 hertz, the 4 kilohertz, then it is uh, so it is indicative of superior canal dehiscence in the patient or third window syndrome. So that is 100% sensitive in these patients. So high amplitude, uh, these are superior canal dehiscence means it's a it's a uh, there is a there is a brittle bone or there is a, a thin plate uh, uh, between in the in the semicircle canal. A superior semicircular canal if that is there is a communication between the middle ear and the superior uh, the 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 uh, the uh, uh, the window canal the superior uh, canal then it will cause uh, energy to pass through uh, easily and it which will produce uh, uh, produce a large responses for uh, uh, it acts as a third window uh, for the energy to pass through next slide So this is a patient number one, but we have, I have seen, this is a superior canal dehiscence with pulsar deltinitis. This is a 35 year old lady who came to her, to me with the complaint of tinnitus, which is low pitched pulsating sound, resembles with heartbeat rhythm in right ear since two years. Tinnitus reported to be increased with amplitude when, head, when turning the head towards the left side. That's what she reported. She had vertigo. Uh, positional which is often while bending down getting up and lots of few seconds since one and a half year one and a half years complaint of buckling sensation in right ear since one year complaint of slightly reduced hearing in right ear since nine months 
history of ear pain in right ear since two years ago one day that is after a flight journey so she reported that that after two years ago when she landed uh, from abroad to here she had a um, she had a severe ear pain in her ear and after one day it went off so no complaint of intolerance to loud sounds autophony nothing was there so we tested her next slide a audiogram shows uh, mild low frequency raising conductive hearing loss on right side left side it shows hearing within normal limits so we did a impedance audiometry also so we could find a type tympanogram which shows a normal middle ear and reflexes are present ipsi and contra but left ipsi was present and contra was absent in this case and because of uh, adequate stimulation level not re not reaching the opposite side the contra was absent in this case DPOE was present in both sides. You can see the image. It's a beautiful DPOE, except 8 kilohertz. It was present in all the frequencies. Next slide. So cervical web findings. You can we, I could find a similar same uh, C web findings on both sides. Uh, you can see that the measured values here. So the P1 is around 13.8, N1 is 23.8. The P1 N1 uh, amplitude is uh, 3.0. Uh, that's the corrected amplitude is 3.0 whereas for uh, the left ear it is 13.2 it's almost same the right and left ear is almost same the results are almost same the amplitude is almost same so the asymmetry ratio is 5.7 you can see in the upper uh, graph there it is around 5.7 so there was no asymmetry observed next slide when i did my ovum I do find a very large OM responses on the right side. You see how much large it is. Can you see the values? It's around 10, but at 100 dB NHL, it's 10.3, 10.3, 15.9, and the amplitude is 98.9 microvolts. Such a large response. And you see in the opposite side, that is uh, 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 the 23, 26 point microvolts. That is the amplitude at 100, same intensity level in the left side. So it is uh, three to four times larger. Which one? The, the the right ear amplitude is three to four times larger than the. Uh, uh, so then I decided to estimate the threshold levels, the VEM threshold levels. So I reduced the intensity. I could find out that 90 dB the responses are present in this uh, left side, and 80 dB is absent. Whereas for the when I reduce the amplitude for uh, 100, 80, 70. At 60, it was absent. Till 70 decibels, I could see a very beautiful peak. So the low VEM threshold, low VEM threshold, and uh, higher larger amplitude responses on the right side is indicative of superior canal distance in this patient. Okay, so that the amplitude asymmetry ratio, you can see it's around 58.4 percent, which is really larger than 30 percent or 35 percent criteria. Next class, next slide. So acute vestibular syndromes. So acute vestibulopathy, acute vestibular symptom syndrome means if a person comes to you with the complaint of vertigo, vomiting, vertigo lasting for hours, more than three hours, three days, four days, complete vertigo, uh, vomiting with vomiting, imbalance, uh, all these things. If you come, that is called vestibular acute vestibular syndromes. The acute vestibular symptoms. It can happen due to stroke. It can happen due to ear infection that is vestibular nerve infection, labyrinthine infection, all these things can cause acute vestibular syndromes. So let us see the few of the vestibular symptoms and syndromes and its uh, findings in the their, this thing. Their vestibular neuritis, often superior vestibular neuritis is common than inferior vestibular neuritis. Uh, so they present with sudden severe vertigo and prolonged vertigo without hearing loss in unidire unidire unidirectional spontaneous nystagmus will be there. That is, uh, if they have a left vestibular lesion, right side, right beating nystagmus, they'll have spontaneous nystagmus, they'll have. Uh, Muglio et al. has studied 40 subjects with vestibular neuritis, and he has used WEMP and uh, VHIT to identify how many are having inferior, how many are having superior vestibular neuritis, and how many are having complete vestibular neuritis. He found that 55% of them had complete vestibular neuritis followed by superior vestibular neuritis and 5% with inferior vestibular neuritis. So the superior vestibular neuritis is more common than inferior vestibular neuritis. Very rarely we do see a inferior vestibular neuritis. I have seen one or two with only inferior vestibular neuritis that we can easily detect using your uh, using your webs. 
will be a very useful tool in detecting this impair. Uh, only vestibular neuritis can be identified by using video head impulse test and vestibular the, 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 or VNG, video head impulse test plus uh, the uh, inferior, uh, the VEMS. Both if you use, that's a nice protocol for detecting uh, acute vestibular syndromes or uh, detecting vestibular neuritis. Next slide. So this is a diagram which shows that the pathway of, uh, you can see the yellow color is your superior vestibular nerve, the blue color one is your inferior vestibular nerve. The yellow color connects the utricle macula where the ova paraises. The yellow color also is connected to your horizontal and superior vestibular nerve, uh, superior semicircle canal, horizontal canal and superior semicircle canal. Inferior vestibular nerve is connected to your uh, uh, posterior semicircle canal and also your sacule. So, if you do clinical head impulse test, head impulse test, head impulse test will be a healthy subject will get everything normal. Unilateral vestibular loss means complete vestibular nerve is there. Complete vestibular vestibular neuritis will get all the results abnormal. That is, uh, C V M will be abnormal, O M will be abnormal. Uh, horizontal in uh, video head impulse test, uh, horizontal canal will be abnormal. Lateral canal will be abnormal. Everything will be abnormal. But in superior vestibular neuritis, only these three, that is your utricular ovum will be abnormal, anterior, uh, the anterior canal and horizontal canal will be abnormal. Whereas in case of inferior vestibular neuritis, these three will be normal and only the sacular C vamp will be abnormal and posterior canal will be abnormal. So you can find out that which of the vestibular nerve is normal. So before studying that, we should understand that it, you will have a normal uh, uh, hearing in these patients. Vestibular neuritis, often you have a normal hearing in this patient. You do a audiogram. Audiogram is very, very important in every vestibular disorder. The first protocol, when you come to your ENT department, when in neurological clinics, they examine the patient. And after that, first thing that we have to do is your audiogram. You see whether a patient with hearing loss and without hearing loss. Without hearing loss, there are several disorders. With hearing loss, there are several disorders. With hearing loss, we have meniere disease. We have uh, 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 vascular, we have uh, schwannomas. All these things have, will have hearing loss. Like uh, superior canal dehiscence, everything will have hearing loss. Whereas the other one, that is the, the vestibular neuritis, does not have a, show a hearing loss. Multiple sclerosis do not show a hearing loss. So these patients, you can differentiate few disorders based on that. Next slide. So this is a patient with the left vestibular neuritis. You see a BC ovump is absent in this case. And there is abnormality in the left horizontal canal testing. LH it is mentioned. LA is mentioned is uh, uh, the left uh, anterior canal. So both are abnormal. You can see that that uh, 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 a lot of uh, um, overt and cab overt saccades are there. Yeah, that's the, this one and the below one. Yeah. These two are abnormal in this case and left to ovump is abnormal. Next slide. Ah, this is a patient which I saw in this is the 60 year old lady who came with continuous vertigo with vomiting and nausea and imbalance during walking. Imbalance while walking, continuous vomiting, vertigo since three days. So she came to the department, we tested her because she is a 62 year old. She had slight presbycusis. You can see a high frequency loss in that binaurally, bilaterally. And history of giddiness lasting for a few seconds to minutes, six months once, since two years ago. See what symptoms she has mentioned. If you ask the patient, uh, uh, she says that uh, history of giddiness. She will be telling, I had this, all these all uh, uh, similar episodes. But uh, this, uh, this symptom, the second symptom is related to BPPB, not related to the continuous vertigo. The present complaint is, she has since three days, she has having continuous vertigo. No complaint of reduced hearing, uh, tinnitus, ear discharge, ear pain, both ears, nothing is there. So your hearing organ is absolutely normal. We can find it from the audiogram. Next slide. When we tested her video head impulse test, uh, her left, you can see the left anterior canal testing and horizontal canal testing. Both are having abnormalities. Uh, the rest, all the canals are normal. And uh, these are your CVAMP and OVAMP findings. CVAMP, I did not find any response both the sides but in ovum i do find a response on the right side but this left side there is no response so this means that usually what will happen there is a high possibility that because of her age there may be damage of a sacrum 
there may be degeneration of the age related changes of your cycle that is causing an absent response in this patient but uh, so i consider as a normal pattern for cvm for for that but in ovum it shows that there is a definitely there is a response in the uh, uh, left ear right ear but not in the left ear it indicates that there is a this is a case of superior vestibular neuritis which is again you have to confirm it with the video adipos test so this finding is related with a left to superior vestibular neuritis next slide labyrinthitis or ischemia causing sensory neural hearing loss sudden sensory neural hearing loss labyrinthitis is infection or uh, ischemia so they will say first the patient as soon as the patient will complain he will say i have reduced hearing loss in my right side suddenly suddenly with vomiting uh, vomiting it started and vomiting recovered but still my hearing loss is not gone and i could not hear from yesterday morning on fine morning i got up i could not hear anything so uh, so that that's a that, that, that's a typical presentation of labyrinthitis i could not hear anything in the right ear or my hearing thresholds have gone down i have tinnitus in the right ear or unilaterally most often labyrinthitis is unilateral and sudden hearing loss they will present with uh, with vertigo vomiting also they can present with and also they can present with uh, uh, tinnitus uh, and blocking sensation also so nagi et al have found that the prevalence of asymmetric AC, asymmetric acvm compared to bcvm in most of the cervical web, uh, in these patients Fujimoto 2015 found that CVM, OVM, and Calorix to be abnormal in 64%, 43%, and 52% of subjects ref, uh, respectively in case of labyrinthitis. So it's not 100% uh, absent. Sometimes it may be present. Sometimes it may be absent also. So absence of OVMs are, are associated with poor prognosis. Nagi et al. 2014. Next slide. Again, this is a patient we have seen some four years back. So this is a patient with left ear labyrinthitis, left ear labyrinthitis. You can see that the audiogram, sorry, right ear labyrinthitis, I mentioned it wrong. It's a light ear labyrinthitis. You can see 27 year old male who has come with a complaint of reduced hearing sensitivity in right ear since eight days. Continuous vertigo, imbalance while walking since eight days. So she yeah, he is a, he's a very, very young man and uh, 27 years. He has imbalance in walking. It has to be tested. Next slide. So when I tested him, right side, both AC threshold, AC VEM, the cervical VEM and uh, ocular VEM, both are absent. Left side, both are present. Okay. So when you say labyrinthine function, labyrinthine testing. So I am just seeing only two aspects I have seen in this patient. I have not uh, seen my VNG, ENG at all. I have not seen my video at dimples test in this patient. So from this, I can say that he has got a damaged cochlea, he has got a damaged utricle, he has got a damaged saccule, and he has also got, if you would have tested a video head dimples test, you could have seen that his, his, uh, uh, these things, his uh, lateral canal, superior canal, and posterior canal are abnormal or not, you can test. If all three are abnormal, it shows that it's a complete labyrinth. Labyrinthitis affecting all the organs, all the vestibular organs in the ear, all the vestibular organs in the ear. So that will be your superior canal, the, the ampullae, the crista ampullaris in the horizontal, anterior and posterior, everything it is affecting. Okay, so next slide. BPPV. So BPPV is by the dislodgement of uh, autoconia in semicircular canal. So usually when there is a disadvantage, the, the dislodgement, usually the, the, the dislodgement occurs from utricle because next to posterior semicircular canal is your utricle. So the autoconia particles from the utricle will fall into the, uh, the, the canal and will cause your symptoms. Usually because it is really little closer to their, your, your utricle, the utricle damage is most often reported in BPPV than with the uh, 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 than with uh, other disorders. So OVM are more abnormal than CVM. Sometimes in uh, chronic BPPV patients, recurrent BPPV, recurrent BPPV means every six months, uh, they will have episodes of vertigo. Uh, one, uh, they will be saying, when I lie down, get up, I have vertigo. So that's the classical symptom. So when I lie down in the bed and get up, 
I would have to go. After three days, it goes away on its own. But this time when I got, I did, didn't go itself. So that kind of complaint will be there. Uh, so so as abnormal OMs are very much common. So you can, uh, uh, myself and uh, I have a few papers published, uh, a few papers on uh, BPPV also. And uh, that the type of WEMP abnormalities, you can get four different types. You can get three different types. You can get you can get your absent responses, or you can get your WEMP responses with reduced amplitude and with reduced amplitude and normal latencies, augmented responses and normal responses. All these four patterns you can get, but not uh, uh, increase in the latency. Latency will be normal in this case. Uh, absent responses it indicates complete degenerated de degenerated absent over indicates complete degeneration of utricle macula. WEMP responses with reduced amplitude, normal latencies, is indicate partial degeneration of utricle hair cells. Augmented responses, augmented means uh, increased amplitude on the affected side. So suppose if you do Dixalpic test, Dixalpic test is right here abnormal and uh, OVMP, CVMP also is, uh, the OVMP also is right here abnormal. That means that it shows say, augmented responses. Augmented responses means the amplitude is in the right ear is high than the left ear. So this will happen due to hypermobility of stereocydia due to detachment of autoconia within the utricle. So from the utricle, the, the autoconia has detached. And because of the detachment, it is not fully detached. It is partially detached. And because of that, when you stimulate the organ, what will happen? The stereocydia will move heavily than normal which is in, in uh, which will cause a larger ovum responses in these patients. Normal responses, then we will suggest it is a normal function of the utricle. There is no degeneration of the utricle. Next slide. So this is a patient with a left uh, BPPV, 36 years male. You can see that uh, the in the left side, uh, there is uh, increased amplitude. Uh, sorry, left to posterior canal BPPV, you have an increased amplitude of OVAMP in this patient uh, for patient number four. And patient number five is uh, right side, you have right posterior canal BPPV, 50 year old female with, uh, you can see that uh, post, this is uh, post neuritis. So in this patient post, usually there are two causes of, uh, if you read your books, uh, there will be uh, two causes of uh, 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 BPPV. One is, uh, Secondary causes that means uh, one is infection, another one is trauma. That's the most common. 50% of them will have either infection or trauma prior, trauma prior to the BPPV symptoms. So, uh, if it is post neuritis, this is a patient with complete vestibular neuritis. That is both right ear CVMP and OVMP is absent in this case. Left side is uh, normal, both the sides. So, it is indicative of uh, neuritis and following a neuritis. So, you have to ask in your history whether this patient has. Uh, uh, severe vertigo, vomiting, imbalance in the you should ask, you should whether these uh, uh, symptoms of uh, complete vertigo, vomiting, and all was there for uh, lasting for three days, admitted to the hospital, in M M admitted in the emergency department, has been happened I Liam Kekma, you should ask. So if they say yes, then there may be, it may be a possible vestibular neuritis. Now at present, the patient reports complaint of when you lie down, get up, you have uh, vertigo, which is lasting for seconds. That's a classical presentation of BPPV. But uh, lasting for hours is an indication of neuritis. So this is a patient which we, we can get a combined patient also where we can have two different uh, uh, pathologies that are combined. So history is very, very important. Every time history is very, very, very important in these cases to identify whether it is neuritis associated with the right posture penal BPPV and all. And all other testing is required to interpret this web results. All test, other test results. See, I'm seeing one aspect of you, only utricle and saccula I've been seeing. I'm not seeing other uh, other uh, functions of the, 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 the canal functions I have not seen. So I have to test those canals to find out whether there is a neuritis a component in this patient or not. Next slide. Menius disease, tuning can be altered. I already told that the one kilohertz is going to be higher than the amplitude of the one kilohertz OM or CVM will be higher than that of the, uh, the, the 500 hertz. So frequency tuning is often used. Next slide. 
so this is a classical patient this is a 42 year old more old male who came with this department complaint of tinnitus diplocusis reduced hearing in left ear since 3 years okay history of vertigo lasting for 30 minutes one episode per day and the frequency of vertigo increases all these are spontaneous vertigo spontaneous vertigo tanavar so, so spontaneous vertigo for 30 minutes frequency of vertigo increased since 2 months that's why he came to the department so he says that this is here the, the this thing is uh, higher vertigo is reported to be aggravated with change in head positions so there are two different complaints here one is called uh, a static a spontaneous complaint spontaneous means always it comes on his own and goes away that's one kind of symptom he's having another vertigo he's having that is due to positional change if i turn towards right side left side uh, these are called dynamic complaints in patients with uh, vestibular disorder so when we tested his hearing left ear he had both ear he had hearing loss but left ear thresholds you see low frequency thresholds has gone to 50 to 50 decibels than the high frequency thresholds so it's a classical indication of the uh, left ear menius disease possibly uh, he's already little uh, uh, he's diabetic he has other uh, disorders and also uh, if you have if you find uh, a classical menius disease diagnosis will depend on your audiometry if it is greater than these many db that is about 20 decibels in the lower frequencies a repeated audiogram shows that so on the during the attack or after the attack if you find the hearing loss in this patient it is indicative of menius disease with the spontaneous vertigo when we tested this patient he showed normal absolutely normal cvamp and ovamp all the latencies were normal this thing a lot if you could observe that the left ear cvamp amplitude is smaller than the ovamp so in that in this case but the asymmetry is not so much this asymmetry is around uh, uh, the, uh around 30 percent only or 25 percent only the asymmetry is so if it is not so significant then we recommend to do one more testing that is to test your uh, mm c vamp at uh, thousand hertz so that we need to uh, test that's a uh, thousand hertz we need to test in this patient to identify this venous disease next slide so central vestibular disorders eighth cranial now already i finished vestibular neuritis so I'll show one or two slides. So I'm going to finish my presentation uh, with uh, some three or four uh, disorders alone. Next slide. So CP angle tumor, 50 to 70 percent of AC BOM, BCO will be abnormal. Larger and medium larger size tumors, more of abnormalities. It helps in pre-operative and post-operative workup. Next slide. So this is a patient. You can see the pay the, the whitest patch. AR mark on your MRI, which is that is the cystic lesion here. That's a lesion here, which is a CP angle schwannoma with minimal extension into your internal artery meters. So the, this patient has a normal audiogram. This almost minimal hearing loss, which has which does not have show any hearing loss. You can see the ABR recordings. ABR recording. You can see the fifth peak is around right side is six milliseconds. This is a right CP angle tumor. So right side, if you see, it's around six. And the left side you see around it is around 5.6 it's slight delay is there slight deviation is there uh, the between the right and left uh, uh, these things i could not find wave one in this patient in the abr three and five is there but the one three and five is there in the left side and uh, we did the cvm testing you can see that the second uh, graph is on cvm no response at 125 even at maximum intensity level no response that indicate complete conduction block complete conduction block usually 125 is enough uh, that indicates a complete conduction block but in the ovum the lower panel you can see that the right side right here there is uh, uh, only n10 15 responses are there they are prolonged in prolonged when compared to the left side you can see the left side is be below 12 milliseconds so it's it's uh, it's at 10 milliseconds you get a n10 response in the left ear but as but where in the right ear i, I could only record at uh, 14 milliseconds so it is a grade 2 waveform or 3 waveform which is a increased sorry grade 2 waveform that's that's the second type of abnormality uh, that is uh, increased latencies alone but the amplitude is also reduced uh, slightly but it is increased so from these findings i can tell that the auditory nerve function is fairly preserved there is no conduction block there uh, this tumor is arising from the inferior vestibular nerve 
usually it will arise from the superior vestibular nerve this uh, tumor is arising from the inferior vestibular nerve where there is a complete damage complete conduction block is there and uh, the right ear it is uh, uh, the 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 ovums are there so that that may be a, there may not be any blockage or it may, may not be arising from that uh, it may not be arising from the uh, 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 the inferior the superior vestibular nerve it is from the mostly from the inferior vestibular nerve and also that could be a reason why there is a absence of uh, cvm in this patient due to the lower brain stem lesion lower brain stem lesion that's a medullary lesion if the lesion is larger in a lower med medulla then also you may see a such kind of finding next slide central vestibular even uh, strokes brain stem strokes 41 33% of cvm per novum abnormalities and cerebellar strokes you can see 36 75% of tested with pica strokes that is posterior inferior cerebellar artery ICA is anterior inferior cerebral artery strokes. Ovums are abnormal in 57% of them, and 50% of ICA is abnormal. Next slide. Multiple sclerosis is reported to be having 30 to 31 to 70% of patients with abnormality. Ovum is from ascending midbrain, a frequency abnormal in the presence of, presence of internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Uh, uh, 45% ovum. So usually ovum abnormalities are higher than CVM. Uh, next slide. So this is a patient which I have tested in my clinic, so which is uh, your, uh, which in your, de in your department, Madras Medical College, where we have seen this uh, patient, a 35 year old female with multiple sclerosis with multiple plagues in your brain stem. And I could see that the ABR is absolutely normal in this patient. Uh, CVM. I have done a three vamp protocol that is CVM, OVAMP, and MVAMP. I have recorded, and I can see that the left side. If you see the left side, the left ear, uh, the the CVM is normal in right ear, absent in the left ear. OVAMP is normal, prolonged in latency in the right ear, absent in the left ear, prolonged latencies in the, of all the MVAMP in the uh, both the sides. So these are the findings. So I have multiple findings in all these VAMPs. Everything uh, is in right side or left side because they have multiple lesion in the brainstem. Multiple abnormalities are seen in multiple sclerosis. Next slide. Parkinson's disease also is reported. So here also they have uh, this is a recent article by Dean et al. 2015, where they have studied these uh, CVAMP OVAMP protocols, all three CVAMP OVAMP MM protocols across the groups. And they found that the CVMP is abnormal in uh, abnormal in the uh, the left uh, the, uh, uh, the the MMPs are much more commonly abnormal, followed by OVM and CVM. Similar similar thing is shown in seen in the multiple sclerosis patient also. MMP is more often abnormal than OVM and uh, 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 CVM. So here in these comparisons you can see that there is an absent response in both uh, masseter muscle and uh, inferior oblique but whereas in sternocleidomastoid, mastoid you can see a very beautiful response in this patient so in this patient with uh, parkinson's disease and also they have said that with the later and early stage and later stages of parkinson disease the abnormality will increase with the later stages of parkinson disease and as the central vestibular disorders the disease progresses the wimp abnormalities are more common in these patients next slide so in summary, pathologies, autologic pathologies, Meniere's disease can have an absent response, reduced response, enhanced response. Superior canal descents, you have an enhanced response. Labyrinthitis, vestibular neuritis, you can have a reduced response and absent response. Neurologic disorders, you can have an absent response, reduced response or delayed response in case of migraine. Spinocerebral degeneration, absent responses, multiple sources, Absent responses or delayed responses, brainstem stroke absent or delayed. But the amplitude, if you see that the amplitude is not much affected by, uh, uh, by, uh, by neurologic disorder. But just say this is a thing to remember. But uh, if you in your general practice, you may see some waveforms which are uh, absent, which are absent in the, uh, 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 the, 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 the amplitude may be lesser in these multiple sclerosis patients also you can do see. So I will not say this uh, reduced amplitude you will not find in patients with uh, uh, stroke patients. Suppose I have a patient who has got cerebellar stroke and uh, if it's towards the right cerebellum, right side of cerebellum, 
then I may find a reduced amplitude on the right side rather than the left side. So that's possible. The connections from the cerebellum to the brainstem are affected in this patient. That could cause a right reduction of amplitude in the right side. There are always in the nervous system, there is always a chance of neural repair. Neural repair and there will say there is there is always a possibility of remyelination in these fibers. Remyelination in the auditory nervous system or the vestibular nervous pathway. That will cause the recovery of the potential also. So you may see a reduced amplitude in such cases also. But for a general understanding, mostly delayed responses are seen. Latencies are delayed in case of central pathologies, whereas reduced or increased amplitude is seen in case of peripheral autologic pathologies. Next slide. Next slide. So when we cannot use CMM poor bump and MM. So in case of connective losses, air connection bumps are not. In case of severe hyperacusis, where they cannot tolerate the sound, definitely don't use it. Involuntary movement of head and neck, possible. Essential head tremor, other neuromuscular disorders like chorea, Huntington's chorea, hyperkinetic uh, movement disorders. And all you cannot do these records only because that will automatically create artifacts and you cannot record these uh, potentials. And CVM specifically, you cannot record in spinal cord. It will be affected in spinal cord injuries where they have difficulty in turning their head towards right or left. Muscular, muscular, uh, muscular atrophy, uh, poor muscular control of sternocleidomastoid muscle, cervical spondylysis, limited head movement patients you cannot test. Ocular worm, especially gaze erogenous Suppose a patient has difficulty in gazing towards 30 degrees, is not able to maintain. So when he starts gazing, the, especially this is more uh, I've seen in patients of uh, schwannomas. I've taken several schwannomas with uh, with uh, CWEP and OVEP. When they start gazing, if they have the gaze nystagmus, they cannot maintain that steady 30 degree gazing. So that may affect your recordings. Not able to sustain, maintain eye gazing, extra ocular motor palsies. So ocular motor nerves, movement of your eyeball is restricted or limited, which will again uh, produce a low amplitude in these patients. Visual vertigo patients. That is, uh, if I look up, I have vertigo. If I look up, I have vertigo. I could not maintain your eye gaze. So the moment you started recording, they will see. They they will they will feel that there the the uh, there is a vertigo. Such patients also become non-cooperative for OM recording. In MM, you have temporomandibular joint disorders, dental problems, and all again affect your MM recordings. MM MM, and this may not be used. May not be. You cannot record perform in these patients. Next slide. Summary. So WEMPs are test for the function of autolith organs. Points to remember. Second is they provide information especially about SACUL, which no other test in the vestibular test battery could provide. Especially SACUL. CWEMP is the only test where you can provide get information about SACUL. You can ask me whether there is any patient who can have only SACUL dysfunction. Only utricle dysfunction. Yes, it is possible. So, only sacral dysfunction will cause sway while walking. Uh, uh, there are few papers recently coming up, uh, uh, reported papers where they have uh, uh, only uh, uh, ovum alone, only sacral alone is impaired. What are the signs and symptoms? If you read it, you can understand what are what are the signs and symptoms. And th that this is a, one of the nice part of webs. Second is 2 WEMP test battery. So OWEMP and CWEMP so, uh, are useful in identifying the lesions along the autolith and vestibular nerve in peripheral vestibular disorder and can help in differential diagnosis of vestibular disorders without other test findings. So in the differential with other test findings, we can help uh, several uh, help in identifying the lesions around several uh, uh, several disorders. We can assess the uh, evaluate and differentially diagnose like vestibular neuritis. Uh, like vestibular with schwannomas and all we can do like ABR you can combine uh, we can see them ABR protocols and all three WEMP test battery that is CWEMP, OWEMP, MM are useful in assessing ascending and descending vestibular pathways in the along the brainstem especially in central neurological disorders it is really useful so hence it can find silent lesion in the brain that are subtle in symptoms and sign even you can if you do not see a lesion in MRI you can find a WEMP abnormality, which indicates that a vestibular tracts are impaired in this patient, and as it could be a central neural dysfunction in this patient also. It helps in monitoring 
with the ease of prognosis that is you can disease prognosis you can see uh, effect of treatment and spontaneous recovery of peripheral and central vestibular disorders you can monitor with these films next slide okay i finished with my presentation thank you for the opportunity any questions is there i will take it thank you sir for the quiet knowledge and interesting session okay dear participants now it's a time for discussion if you have any question and they ask or share your questions in the chat box so there is one question i have got how is the amplitude is varied uh, and what are the other changes that can be seen for different electrode placements yes so what happens is when you place in the uh, middle one third middle what that is also fine but if you go a little below than that or lower one third what is going to happen is you may get sometimes shorter latencies or the reduced amplitude you can see because in bell to under montage you should always use your one upper one third the latency is going to be shorter some places sometimes you may get a p13 response at uh, uh, at around 10 milliseconds you may think it is much low much which is supposed to be getting at 13 you may get it at p10 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 also and the amplitude will be much smaller in that case yes any other questions okay will the will the prolongation of latency and reduction in amplitude as age increases by basis with the diagnosis and older population with this type of disease yes so as you as if you see a patient maybe around 70 year old i i have recorded around 90 year old also definitely some patients do get vems nice vems on both sides i have seen they could maintain the muscle tension and they can you can get in that but a lot of patients if you see uh, uh, uh this is the one of the drawbacks of vems also that is above 50 or 60 years old there will be a absence responses in these patients uh sometimes it can be bilaterally or at uh, the vem threshold increases so uh, you may try to increase 130 and you can record maybe 125 or 130 db spl you can record you see there is no responses okay then you have to correlate with your clinical findings you have to depend on your clinical findings mri findings or uh, lab other test results like radio head impulse testing or any other testing to identify what is the pathology in these patients you cannot diagnose based on the vem c vem and o vem in these cases so that's one of the drawbacks in these uh, pathologies that the dulls and also in most of the times when 5 to 10% of patient you will encounter a conductive wearing loss they will also have neuritis with conductive wearing loss uh, labyrinthitis so i have seen a lot of patient with labyrinthitis and conductive wearing loss they will have a perforation in the right side they have a labyrinthitis and uh, it's which is indicated as a total hearing loss in one side uh, which is having which, which is having severe profound uh, mixed hearing loss in that side so if you do vem definitely is going to be absent because it's a perforation there you are not going to record a uh, 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 mmc in this patient because of the energy being reduced to be in the canal so in that case you may have to rely on some other test not vem testing so you can write it as uh, the vem results vems are absent due to the conductive component you can write or the airborne gap which is present in the audiogram it is absent so um, such places it may not be used for and sometimes you can see asymmetry in these patients that is uh, uh, maybe 40 50% in a normal person also possibly that you may have to take a upper cut off and correlate with other test findings to always case history is very very important with the history you can diagnose 50% of patients next to one 10% 20 50% is by the by your vestibular testing i give a 50% weightage to your case history and the the symptoms 
and uh, 10 to 20 percent you can give weightage to your uh, weightage to your uh, uh, clinical examination that will be posterior dexalpic testing uh, tandem walking all these testing yes any other questions Okay, uh, shall I end the, uh, if there is any question I would, I would like to answer, anything, anything, any other people want to ask any questions about WEMPS? Thank you so much, sir. We have uh, covered almost all of the questions that we have got. Okay. Uh, so do you have to give any concluding comments before ending the session? Uh, yeah, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, giving this opportunity. It's a nice uh, uh, time to interact with students to understand them. And uh, it is again a one part of the vestibular system. It's just a one part. It may be which comes into audiologist purview. Uh, mostly uh, you don't have restrictions for doing them because most of the evoke potential system is done by audiologist. So it's one of the nice uh, uh, a test that the audiologist can do without uh, dependency on uh, ENTs and VNG at a part we may have to depend on that depend on ENT for caloric test sometimes uh, sometimes uh, if a vestibular vehicle simulation happen in VNG or uh, a caloric test is uncomfortable to the patient this is fairly comfortable the VNG the, the WEMPS tests are fairly comfortable to the patients and they don't have any uh, discomfort while testing they don't feel any discomfort and they don't uh, so that's the one of the largest advantages of it though there are several disadvantages where you cannot test in some patients this is a this is a very very good uh, a tool where we can correlate with other testing yeah a lot needs to be explored in these areas also i think there are very few studies in the clinical side I feel a lot uh, pathologies have variety of web responses still, which has not been explored. Explored, or the frequency tuning is itself is not studied in so many other disorders. Maybe we have, when we do it, we may find it in a, a range of uh, pathologies also. Still, it's an interesting topic. A lot of PG students, UG students can take uh, uh, research on and then work uh, and find out. And then every time a new one day, every year, you see a lot of papers coming on uh, this thing. The thing which I told you at 4 kilohertz, uh, WEMP is 100% sensitive. Uh, it's a recent, uh, recently published article, uh, which is uh, emphasizing the role of 4 kilohertz stone bus on sternocleid with the, the, on the superior canal dehiscence disease. So uh, updates are being uh, coming in this WEMP. Uh, 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 and it's a nice tool to as a clinical tool as well as a research tool it can be used yeah thank you for the opportunity i'll end my presentation here thank you so much sir you know to avail e-certificate kindly fill the feedback form the link of the same is posted in the chat box dear participants now we have a photo session my request you to turn on a video mode
Thanks everyone. Now may I request Mr. Kamala Kanna, Assistant Professor, Department of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology, to express his oath of thanks. Good evening everyone. I am here to offer gratitude for today's webinar. First and foremost, I would like to thank our Secretary, Reverend Dr. Sister Annie Xavier, for her selfless support. I thank our well-wisher, Reverend Dr. Sister Krishna Bridget, from principal, for granting us permission to organize this webinar. I would like to thank Reverend Sister Dr. Lud Mary, academic coordinator, for her constant support and guidance. I would like to express my word of gratitude to Mr. R. Sundaresan, head of the department, for his vision and commitment. I would like to thank our honorable speaker, Mr. Vignesh Esther, for enlightening us with his knowledge. The webinar of our help with immense knowledge and aid delightful to listen to. Thank you, sir. My heartfelt thanks to the participants from various institutions. I thank our technical team, Mr. Sarmi and Mr. Anand, for their constant support, last but not the least. I thank our dear students and dear colleagues for making this event a grand success. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir, for your words of gratitude. Dear participants, in order to avail each certificate, kindly fill the feedback form. The link of the same is posted in the chat box. Indeed, I thank each and everyone for joining with us. Much obliged to have you all. Have a good evening.